Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good. Uh, now I know the, mic the microphone works. Is it? <laughs> Welcome to the sixth annual Sandy Skolnick, excuse me, Sandra. I do recall her fondly as Sandy Skolnick Lecture. Uh, this is the only event of its kind in Maryland that brings together great thinkers in the field of early care and education to present and discuss the latest research, policy, and visions for the future. This lecture series was named in honor in the legacy of Sandra J. Skolnick, a visionary leader and champion for young children their families, and other caregivers. And I might say a mentor and a friend. She recognized the need for high quality childcare and built Maryland Committee for Children into a driving force for accessible, affordable, high quality care. Sandy pioneered the development of the Maryland Child Care Resource Network a statewide network that continues to provide child care resources and referral services to Maryland's families, uh, excuse me, to Maryland's families, um, as well as training and technical assistance to child care providers. She built a strong program of public policy and advocacy that contributed to Maryland's standing as being one of the best states for child care in the nation. Sandy helped advance early childhood mental health services, an assessment system for school readiness, and plans for access to high quality care from birth to age five. Most of all, Sandy inspired her colleagues and friends. Her work lives on through Maryland Family Network and in each one of you who strive for a better world where all young children and their families have resources to learn and succeed. As I mentioned, um, Sandy was a mentor and a friend. I actually um, had the honor of being, I think, maybe the only person to serve, maybe not now, um, but as a um, board member and an executive committee member of what is now the Maryland Family Network, and Maryland Committee for Children. And during those years, one of the things that was extremely important to Sandy, we talk about public policy and advocacy, was bringing together groups just like this to make sure that the work that we do every day um, is recognized by those who set public policy, by our legislators. But that happens because you understand the research, and you can speak from a point of knowledge. So this evening, we honor Sandy as we continue the work that she started many years ago. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Robert Blum, um, <laughs> the chair, I'm, I'm looking at the notes to make sure we get it right. Thank you, Steve. Uh, <laughs> the chair of the department, that's an inside joke. The chair of the Department of um, Population, Family, and Reproductive Health at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Blum has been a friend of Maryland Family Network. We appreciate all Dr. Blum and his colleagues do for us, including hosting this, the Sandy J. Skolnick Lecture, year after year. Please welcome our host, Dr. Robert Blum. Thanks, welcome, uh, good afternoon, and it is a pleasure to see you all here. Uh, this is a very, very special lecture, both because it memorializes uh, Sandy Skolnick and because it brings uh, here to Baltimore, a focus on children and uh, child development. And today we're going to be looking very specifically at some of these uh, issues in an extraordinary film and uh, discussion. Child care in America is not only a patchwork, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy for many of our children because 
Those who come from families of means have access, and all too often those who don't have an early start in life of disadvantage. Imagine what this country would be like if over the last 20, 30, 40 years, all children had access from the beginning of their lives to high quality childcare, to high quality early child development. Where would we be today as a country? We were once at a point where we were so close to realizing this vision, but it slipped away. What will it take to get that close again and not to let it slip away, but to make it happen? The expert panel who we have assembled here today have perspectives, ideas, and a vision. And I know that everyone in this room does as well because we are here because of our commitment to children. I look forward to your ideas and to hearing the ideas of the panelists. But first, join me in viewing Once Upon a Time, when child care for all wasn't just a fairy tale. This is part two of a PBS uh, series, Raising, uh, The Raising of America series. <laughs> It's aired on PBS across the country, and it reframes the way Americans look at early child health and development. It's an extraordinary glimpse into where we are and could be. Let's take a look. I'm Margaret Williams. I'm the executive director of Maryland Family Network, and I have the a happy job of extending the Thanksgiving um, spirit by expressing gratitude to a number of people and organizations, starting with Dr. Blum and Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health for being our host. Um, and moving on to our sponsors, this um, annual event is endowed um, by the Child Care Foundation, uh, Leg Mason, and we've got um, Brian Eeks here from Leg Mason. And M&T Bank and PNC Bank, and Joanne Towers Hampson from PNC is here, and we're very grateful for your support of this event. Um, I also want to thank um, our partners in public policy advocacy. Uh, there are a number of people here from the um, the five families we call them um, who work tirelessly on behalf of child care providers in this state. Um, the Maryland Child Care Association, the National Association for the Education of Young Children, the Head Start Association, the Maryland State Family Child Care Association, and the Maryland School Age Child Care Alliance. So those big five represent the child care workforce and work very hard um, along with Maryland Family Network to see that um, we've got good quality care that's affordable in Maryland. Um, and of course, to the child care providers themselves, a number of you are in this room. We are very grateful for what you do every day for our kids and for us parents and grandparents. Um, it's really, after, after being a parent, the most important work there is. Um, and now I'm going to introduce uh, my colleague, a child care industry. So I, I realized as I was preparing these remarks that, that Steve Rohde is really Maryland's czar of child care. There is no one with a statewide perspective and authority um, and who has the respect that Steve does in this field. So I am delighted to welcome Steve to the podium and he's gonna introduce our panelists. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for making time for this. This is a very important conversation we need to have. Uh, please welcome, uh, help me in welcoming our, our three panelists. Let me start with Walter S. Gilliam, who's the director of the Edward Ziegler Center in Child Development and Social Policy and associate professor of child psychiatry and psychology at the Child Study Center of the Yale School of Medicine. His research analyzes ways to make effective policies that translate into effective services for early childhood education and intervention. Dr. Gilliam is also, also explores ways to improve the quality 
of pre-kindergarten programs and child care services. He has researched the impact of early childhood education programs on children's social uh, school readiness, effective methods for reducing classroom behavioral problems, and reducing the incidence of preschool expulsion. Dr. Gilliam has led national analysis of state-funded pre-kindergarten policies and mandates and the effectiveness of these programs at improving school readiness and educational achievement. Dr. Gilliam is a frequent, frequently on Capitol Hill and traveling the nation to provide consultation to state and federal decision makers. Next on our panel is Dr. Renee Boynton Jarrett. She's an associate professor of pediatrics at Boston University School of Medicine. She's a practicing primary care pediatrician at Boston Medical Center, a social, social epidemiologist and the founding director of the Vital Village Community Engagement Network. She received her AB from Princeton University, her MD from Yale School of Medicine, and a doctorate of science in social epidemiology from Harvard School of Public Health. And if that weren't enough, she also completed her residency in pediatrics here at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Boynton Jarrett's research focuses on the role of early life adversities as life course social determinants of health, including obesity, puberty, and reproductive health. She has a specific interest in the intersection of community violence, intimate partner violence, and child abuse and neglect and how neighborhood characteristics influence these patterns. Through the Vital Village Network, she is supporting the development of community-based strategies to promote child well-being in three Boston neighborhoods. And then finally, we have Dr. Al Zaychik, who's the Director of the Office of Child and Adolescent Services Mental Health Administration at the Maryland State Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. He's a child and adolescent psychiatrist and a member of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry's work group on community systems of care. He is a member of the clinical uh, faculty in psychiatry here at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, the Georgetown University School of Medicine, and the University of Maryland Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Zaychik has a special interest in developing a full system of care in Maryland for children and adolescents with mental health needs. He integrates mental health services into all existing programs for youth, including schools, early childhood, juvenile services, and social services programs. He's also a great friend and partner to Maryland Com Family Network and the work that we do. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. So we asked each of our panelists to give some thought to the film that we showed you, the clip that we showed you, um, and to have uh, some... 44 years. Uh, you got a chance to see on there uh, Edward Ziegler. I direct the Edward Ziegler Center in Child Development and Social Policy at Yale, and Edward Ziegler is the of his life. Uh, he talks about it a lot. Um, it's an interesting thing to hear him reminisce and talk about how close we were to something as, as, as big as as a comprehensive program of child care and health care and maintain 44 years and to also think about how few things have changed, especially in terms of some of the strategy that you heard. You heard some strategy and you heard some counter strategy. Uh, you actually heard uh, a very poignant quote in there about how, how the uh, veto speech was written specifically to highlight ideological and political aims, right? and I don't see a whole lot of difference in terms of strategy today. Um, what's interesting to me about this is to think about not only did we come so close to something like that, but when you come so close to something like that, there's a fall. And the fall basically, what we have now, uh, state-funded pre-kindergarten programs and educational services largely in our public schools, mostly for four-year-olds, some of the times for threes and fours, focusing largely on school-based services, but lacking a lot of the comprehensive services and a lot of the parent involvement that's a focus of Head Start. And we have subsidized child care, which is largely about making sure that parents have the care that they need for their children in order for them to go to work. And so we now have, in the fall of, of the Comprehensive Child Development Act, three pieces, three pieces that basically put our parents in a position where they have to decide, 
Do I want for my child comprehensive services focused on my child's overall well-being and parent involvement? Or do I want my child to have access to all of the support services that a public school would have to offer? Or do I want to go to work? And that's basically the choice that we have for our parents now because Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall, broke into three big pieces, and we haven't been able to find a way to put those pieces back together again ever since. Basically, the Comprehensive Child Development Act got picked up in different departments within government. And as a result of that, it became siloed. And then as a result of that, the services became siloed. The funding became siloed. Uh, we have professional organizations designed specifically to advocate for each one of them, very well-meaning, but as a result, the professional organizations themselves help fortify the walls of the silo. And that's basically what we have inherited right now for our children. This untenable dilemma that we place parents in regarding, do I want my child to, uh, actually, probably closer to about two and a half years ago, he fell. He fell going into his house. We've been trying to talk him into using a cane for a long time, and he wouldn't do it. And so he fell and um, broke his hip. And so he went to the hospital at Yale New Haven Hospital, and they contacted me. I went to the hospital to check on him. His wife, Bernice, was there, and I was there. And it was apparent that he was going to need to have surgery. So he went down to the anesthesia room, and there were two anesthesiologists there, a younger one and an older one. And so he's down there, and he's, 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 he's going under. And he's getting kind of groggy, and he's saying, Walter, Walter. And he motioned for me to come over, and I'd come over, and I'd say, yes, sir. He said, what's Obama doing on Head Start reauthorization? <laughs> and I said, I said it's, we're un it's under control. Head Start reauthorization is going to happen. It's, it's, don't, don't let Linda Smith mess up CCDBG reauthorization. <laughs> and he said, it's okay. It's fine. It's fine. And he, he wanted to talk about, about the things that matter to him. He wanted to talk about Head Start. He wanted to talk about CCTPG. Um, he wanted to make sure that all these things were, 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 were going well. Part of it, I think, had to do with the fact that these were the things on his mind, and these are the things that worried him. Uh, these are the things that, that he's fretted about for a very long time. But I think part of it had to do also that he wanted to make sure that people knew what to focus on just in case. And so I, I sat there and I listened to it. And then something very astonishing happened. Uh, one of the two anesthesiologists, the younger one, came over to me and he said, is he talking about Head Start, the preschool program for poor kids? And I said, yes, that man right there is the father of Head Start. And he said, you mean he, he ran all the Head Start programs in New Haven, Connecticut? I said, no, 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 no. He, 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 he ran Head Start federally and, and, was, and was the last living member of the planning committee that put Head Start together. As a matter of fact, he... He sometimes says in presentations that, that his claim to fame is that he's one of the only members of the Nixon administration that didn't have to go to jail for what he did. <laughs> and so I told him the whole story of it and everything, and, and his, his, job, his draw, jaw started to drop farther and farther. He walked over to him, and he's, he's, he's kind of groggy at this point, and he kneels down to him and he says, thank you, I'm a Head Start graduate. My mother had always told me that the reason that I turned out so much different than many of the other children in my neighborhood was that I had a good start to school because of Head Start. And Ed Ziegler opened up his eyes and he looked over and he said, what was your Head Start teacher's name? <laughs> <laughs> as, as if he would know the name of every single Head Start teacher in, in the United States. But what was important was the anesthesiologist knew he knew the head, name of his Head Start teacher. Let me tell you a couple of really quick things before I, before I end. When Ed Ziegler was on the planning committee, he was 35 years old, the son of immigrants, raised in poverty, selling fruit at the back of a wagon. The anesthesiologist at the same time, 35 years old, an assistant professor at Yale, came over here, son of immigrants, because he was part of the Cambodian refugee crisis, and was attending Head Start when he was living in the basement of a, of a, of a Baptist church. And so we told this story at the, at the 50th anniversary of Head Start, and we had about 5,000 sets of, of, of crying eyes in the room, especially when, uh, when we said that they hadn't met in the past two years until now, and uh, anesthesiologists came up out of the audience and 
sat down next to him and gave him a little home visit just to check on his patient. And at the end of it, he looked over to him, uh, Dr. Ziegler, and he said, totally off script, he said, I can tell you this, I, um, I had no problem at all putting my life in the hands of one of my Head Start babies. Now, I could sit here and I can talk to you about science, and I certainly conduct an awful lot of science. And science can tell us an awful lot having to do with how we do what we do and the processes that work and the processes that are effective. But it cannot tell us how we value the things that we value. Um, I, I have certainly come to believe that what we're talking about here is important from a science perspective, it's important from an economic perspective, but it's also important from a social justice perspective. And it's important from a preservation of our, home, our whole human species, and nothing really short than that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Walter. Um, certainly, Walter describes one of the overlays uh, to the whole child care dilemma, which is the fragmentation, the silos, and how there aren't comprehensive services. Our next speaker is Dr. Boynton Jarrett, and in addition to working at the uh, Boston University School of Medicine, she's a practicing pediatrician with a, a working program in uh, uh, Boston. Uh, can we get your perspective on this, please? Uh, good to see you all. I, I have to say that I'm truly humbled and honored to be speaking at this particular lecture series that is in name of a truly visionary thinker, a silo buster, right? A truly innovative thinker who realized that if you put people who do different things for children together, something special can emerge out of that. And as Dr. Gilliam just said, one of the biggest challenges we face to rewriting our collective story of what our vision of early childhood should be is that we're separated. We've separated funding, we separate how we work, we separate how we think about policies and structures. So I have to say that I'm overwhelmed to be speaking here today, especially here at Hopkins, a place where I had the opportunity to care for so many patients and families in a city that I truly love. Um, I saw families who did amazing with their children despite told the wrong story about what early childhood education and care really means, right? There is overwhelming evidence in economics, neuroscience, public health, any field you can name that says that investing in early childhood is not going to cause any harm <laughs> and is going to have reams of benefits, not only for those children and their families, but for the society. The same point in time, we've been hampered by fear and a story that says parental responsibilities should operate in a certain way. And if we infringe on those by providing a more robust and enriched opportunity structure that every family can have access to that they have for truly paying attention to the interactions that support positive social and emotional development of children is impinged upon by a range of competing demands and pressures. We have a gap in terms of the strategies that we provide for families, and the gap is based on policy, right? So we believe in two generation strategies that support parents as well as children, but we don't meet that with policy. And in doing so, when we don't see affordable housing as a health benefit and a developmental benefit, when we don't see providing parents and families with robust 
mental health services, with robust early child enrichment and care, with robust work policies that make taking leave when you need to available and possible and feasible. There's a backhanded course <laughs> to children in that there's stress in the home, there's a lack of a ability to form that secure, stable attachment that children need to grow and develop, and it has repercussions over time for the development of that child and for who they'll be in the future. We know early childhood adversities have an enduring impact on health and development throughout the life course. We know that in order to minimize and mitigate and prevent those adversities, we need a much more robust system than any single family can provide for their child. It really takes a community approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renee. Um, during the introduction and in Renee's comments, we were talking about behavioral services and early childhood mental health services. And certainly a person who's taken the lead in Maryland is Dr. Al Sajic. Al, can we get some comments from you, please? Absolutely, Steve, thank you. And I'm honored to be here with you all today. I know there's that old phrase, preaching to the choir. I think you all probably do know the science behind the importance of, of early childhood intervention. You know, the, the, the great reward and, and economic reward that you get for investing in young children, I think we all believe in. I was thinking here, what to say, you know, representing the state of Maryland. You know, the, the film shows an effort of great advocacy that didn't get to its, its, its final result that everybody wanted so much. And so I'm going to just take a minute and talk about one that Sandy Skolnick, actually, in honor of her, was incredibly um, instrumental in, in achieving here in Maryland, and that's, I see Tressa Hannes here with our, our colleagues from Maryland State Department of Education. Um, Together we were able to accomplish with the Maryland Committee for Children, Maryland Family Network, um, um, Margaret's support and many others, but, but Sandy's particularly her interest in legislative, or her knowledge of, of the legislative process. We partnered and got behavioral health consultation available to all child care centers around the state. It still exists. Happened, in, interestingly, under Republican administration. It was Governor Ehrlich who supported it, and, uh, and that money has been sustained over many years. So I think whether it's a Republican or, or um, a Democrat who is in charge of government, we currently have a Republican governor and Governor Hogan and what I was thinking to say to you all is we have to, I think, reinvigorate ourselves to do something here in Maryland. You know, the, the programming for, for young children and their families, we've made a good start. We have good child care in the state, but it is inconsistent. I know even though we have great advocacy and great support from the Maryland State Department of Education uh, and, and others to support it. But I think we can do certainly more in the state. And, and I guess my two-second story, you know, I had been children's mental health director in the state for 20-some years, took a little hiatus for the last six months and being the executive director of our behavioral health administration, which I was asked to do by the current health secretary and um, doing all this adult stuff, and I've got to get back to doing kids. So I'm going to do that in a week. And still want to hang around for a while and, and, and help join my colleagues in this audience to do a little more for kids and to take things a little further. And maybe we can all use this new governor's interest in families in from Annapolis. So the good work there with our secretary of budget and management, uh, Robert Brink uh, uh, Brinkley, what's his right? David Brinkley, sorry. Oh, anyway, should know that. But, you know, I think we've got to advocate again. And, and how did I get involved with this? And this is just a two-second story. I've got two minutes to say it. Many of you know Jane Nitzer. Um, Jane was um, a wonderful advocate for children, unclaimed children in the 1980s, was um, the, the director of the National Center for Children in Poverty at Columbia University, and got me going on this. You know, I was the children's mental health director in Maryland for a few years and sat in one of our organization meetings of the, all the child directors get together as the adult mental health commissioners get together under an organization called Nash. But anyway, I was sitting there and Jane was talking, as you know, in the later years of her life advocating for early childhood mental health. And I was sitting in the audience and she was really, really advocating for policy change 
to look at young children and their mental health needs and, and, and what we should be doing for those children. The research was coming out in Walter's research about kids getting expelled from childcare, still quote Walter's research all the time as, as why we need to intervene early and that sold our, 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 our program to reach out to little kids in childcare who are having trouble. Right, a three-year-old getting expelled, something's wrong. You know, we're missing something. The child, the family needs some support. Um, the staff may need some support and we're doing that here in Maryland. We could do it more, we can spread it out, but we're at least doing it. So anyway, I heard Jane talk and I said, well, gee, what, what's happening for young children? I'm a child psychiatrist, I care about young children. Let me go back and figure this out. So I, I joined, um, 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 at, at the time, uh, Carolyn Heath, who was the assistant superintendent at the State Department of Education for Special Education, and Nancy Grasmick was our state superintendent who cared about young children and children's mental health, and I said, hey, you wanna do something about this? They said, yeah, we should do something about this. So I said, well, what should we do? So a couple of names got mentioned, and I met Sandy at a meeting, and God, I just got to know all of you who are the early childhood advocates in our state, a whole new group of people I had no idea was even here. And so thanks to Sandy, we met you know, some good partners and, and worked hard together, did research to show that this worked, got it through the legislature. Budget analysts said, this is one of the first times two agencies, education and health, put together a request for funding that showed research, it had research that showed that it worked, like behavioral health consultation works, helps kids stay in childcare, they don't get expelled, simple outcome, and they put in the $2 million that the governor put in and, and didn't cut a penny and it's still there. So I, I, my word to you all is that let's advocate again, let's take this new administration and continue to advocate with uh, our, our governor and, and, and our continued way. Oh, and I know our health secretary and this governor, you know, know a couple of people, you know, Addie Eckert and I, Senator Eckert knows the, the, ch the child people and she's a Republican senator from the Eastern Shore and Addie and I had dinner together at the inauguration. So we're gonna do what we can to support you all to try to, again, play the political system right, use it right to get what young children need. I think we can do it here in Maryland. Maybe not in the federal government yet, you know, there's all that stuff going on there, but we can do it here in Maryland, and I think states are supposed to take care of their children and families. And we've done it pretty good in Maryland, but as Margaret said, we're still not at the high level that we want to get to. So I think with your support, we'll, we'll join you on that and try to get some energy going again and take some new things forward. So we can do it here in Maryland. So three things real quick. One is I would add to Al's story, the late Linda Heisner was also yes. key in that, and I want to give yes. recognition to late Linda Heisner. Yes. Uh, second, we do have a public policy forum and a, a public advocacy, and I would urge you, if you're not currently involved, to get involved. Uh, lots of easy ways. Please see us afterwards. I know that Clinton McSherry is here, who's in charge of our public policy under Margaret's direction, so please make sure you do touch base on that. We have a microphone on either <coughs> side, and we have about 10 minutes for questions if someone or someones have questions. Um, and I was, I was expecting people not to stand up and jump right away. So I, I would raise a question that was raised early on in the film, which talked about Ameri America as a meritocracy and how uh, what transpired with the child care legislation really worked against that. I wonder if any of the panelists have thoughts on that. I guess I'm getting pointed to. So um, uh, I, I think um, there's strong evidence, and I don't need to harp on this here in Baltimore. I know you all have had um, quite a year as a city, as we've had as a nation. There's quite strong evidence that we have differences in opportunities and resources that vary geographically. We know school systems um, vary geographically, and we know that area disadvantage is a true and real phenomenon. So it is a pileup for a lot of families in that the school structure is, is challenged, the resource infrastructure to support families within that same neighborhood is challenged, that economic and employment opportunities are challenged. And at the same time, we have, you know, our model of Benjamin Franklin, and you take your two cents and you're rubbing them. We predict when we see a child what they're gonna go off and do. What gets in the way of that, right? 
access to opportunity. Just access mm -hmm. to opportunity structures that are robust and, and viable. And I think that that is a true phenomenon that we see scientifically, we see in all of our public health and epidemiology patterns socially. So um, access to opportunity, um, you know, really is what needs to match a child's, you know, natural born potential. Thank you. I think we have a question. Good evening, my name is Chiquita Crawford. I am the chair of Baltimore City CCAT, which stands for Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee. And I find it um, amazing that we are scheduled to have our next meeting is the topic is um, early education, early childhood education. So this falls right in with what we're gonna be uh, discussing on December the 14th. Um, but my question is this, um, I came in late, so maybe I missed part of this, but my question is, based on what I saw on the film, um, what is preventing us from implementing what was going to be implemented and now isn't other than cost and possibly getting everyone together to put the three parts together and make it, um, I mean, I know it would have to be updated, but to make everything work as we had wanted it to work. I mean, I have worked with special education and, um, before, and I've worked with the, um, see how I wanna say this, with the Maryland Department of Disability a little bit, and I know that a lot of their systems were antiquated and they were using old software and stuff like that, so I know that maybe some of that type of stuff might be it, but what in general with the feds is preventing everything from coming together other than funding to make everything work that we can't get it back together. Okay, thank you for your question. One of our panelists? Um, I'm, I'm happy to dive into that one. I, it, it's, a, it's a few different things. I mean, in terms of the bigger issue, it's, it's basically will. Uh, there is not a shared will to do what we're talking about doing. Um, and until we have a shared will to do what we're talking about doing, it's gonna be hard to be able to get much passed. But in terms of the other part of your question, which is, how come we can't do better with the parts that we do have? I heard that in there too. And, and, and I think a lot of that has to do at all levels of government uh, with, with, with territory and with turf and with decision-making powers. Um, in, in times of scarcity, uh, when, when resources are scarce, it's amazing how much people will cling even to the smallest grain. Um, and that's basically where we are. Uh, we all have much bigger aspirations for what we would like to do for our children and families than what we do. We just don't have the resources available to do it. So we have scarce resources. And in the, in the existence of scarce resources, you have folks wanting to hold on to whatever power that they can possibly have within whatever silos that currently exist. And I don't say that in any condemning way. That's just the way nature goes. That's the way humans are. But we have to find some way, I think, to, to, to get above that to be able to find a way to be able to put together comprehensive sets of services for our children, even though it may mean that some people will have to lose a little bit of power and some people might have to work with folks that they're not used to working with. Right now, we have a set of circumstances within the federal government because we have Head Start and we have within their separate funding streams, separate monitoring structures, separate missions, separate goals, separate accountabilities that then get passed down to the state level where they're then replicated at the state level. And then they get passed down to the local level. And then we hope, we pray, that somebody at the local level will have the courage to actually try to work it out and work across those, all the time knowing that if they break a rule, they may get in trouble. That's basically the problem that we have. It'll, it'll take a lot of work to untangle. <laughs> But when a perfect storm comes, then somehow we find a way to make it work. So why can't we assume that there's a perfect storm right now and make it work? Well, Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more question, Dr. Blum. So I'll try to talk loudly so the people in the back can hear. I was struck once again that uh, the conservative right has captured the narrative. How do we change our narrative 
here in Maryland. Because we capture the I agree. I, I'll jump on that, Dr. Bum. I, I, I think we have, again, a, a new opportunity in our state. And, and I think I saw it happen, you know, many years ago. And, and under Governor Ehrlich, I mean, we, we got a program started that had not existed in this state in, in terms of the early childhood mental health consultation. And it was collaboration among state agencies, amongst advocates and families, and, 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 and us in state government, local government. But we had a couple of champions in the legislature um, a, a delegate and a, and a senator at the time, and and we were able to get the executive branch to work with us. So I think we need to look for those champions again. And 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 I don't think this governor is going to, you know, if you think about how Governor Hogan is is some some of the things that are coming out publicly, concern for the children's cabinet is disconnected kids. Well, I of course am going to say. Well, if a child is dropping out of school in high school, we missed some things all along the way before that happened. Of course we did. And, and so how do we do a better job again to reach out to children earlier? And all the work that you all do and we try to support you to do for young children is going to prevent kids, if we do it right, get them that good start and prevent them from getting lost later on. I think we hook our ideas onto ideas that the administ this administration is putting out there as we always do as good politicians, you know? I mean, all of us are good politicians. You gotta be a good politician to get stuff done. And, and so you find out where a new administration is headed and we kind of connect our, our, our good ideas to what they're saying they value and try to get something done again. In early childhood efforts, no one's gonna disagree with them, um, uh, at least on our state level. So I think we'll, we wanna work together again and, and try to get whatever we wanna get accomplished, accomplished, because I, I think it can be done in Maryland, because we've got good people, good citizens, good advocacy groups all through the state that if we kinda hook up on something or decide on what we wanna do, Maybe we can get something accomplished again. So, so I think whether conservative, I mean, moderate or liberal or whoever it is, I think we want to get to those who make the decisions in the state because they all understand little kids and the research and the science. It's just all there, you know. And my own personal view, and this is Al talking, who is going to say no to getting kids ready to, to benefit from school, to do well in school, to educate? And I said this early, and I'll say it one more time. I worry about the children in our city and in our, our, the poverty areas of our state who are not getting what they need to make a good life for themselves. I know Hopkins has this great experiment. Hopefully, I'd love to hear what's happening here at the, the public school in the city that, that you know Hopkins is working um, uh, with the public school system on to maybe get some better ideas, better practice that we in the state could help support. Um, you know, I, 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 I think our message is going to be clear to anyone, and, and I think in a state you have better access to the leaders because they are available and they're Marylanders and they want to do a good job for the children here in the state, and I think we have an opportunity to try again. So we'll try again. I know Margaret's already led the path for us to start <laughs> try again, right? So we'll do it. And Margaret, can you come up and join me, please? Let's thank our panelists, please. I want to thank you all for coming this evening, and we look forward, we do this every year about this time in the fall, and we look forward to seeing you again next year, so thanks very much. Thank you.